love you guys. And so uh, take your Bibles now to Acts chapter 17, fifth book of the New Testament. We close out my series today entitled Champions. Champions. I pray it's been a blessing to you. I really do. I pray more than anything else that everywhere we've been on this journey so far that it has blessed you. But today I want to get into the final chapter Uh, The final uh, sermon, I should say, in this series entitled, Champions Love Unity and Diversity. Champions Love Unity and Diversity. Do you you believe that? Do you agree with that? That's what I have for us today. It's what the Holy Spirit has given me. And of course, if you're new with us, we've been in in this series entitled, Champions. We've taken people's lives in the Bible And we reflect upon their different wins, even their losses, and how they overcame those losses. And God fashioned in them a heart to serve him, and they became the champions that God had called them to be. And we want that same mindset. So today, I want us to look at it. If you'll get out your Holland First app and your Bible, those watching at home, it's there as well. But let's look at Acts 17. I want to start at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Arabacus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world And everything in it, everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And verse 26, I believe, is the capstone. And he has made from one blood every nation, of mankind to dwell upon the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. That means to yearn for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our very being. Father, anoint the preaching of your word. This morning, O oh God, I have sought your face both in preparation and now in prayer. And God, may I say nothing more than what you would want me to say. And God, when I am anointed of you, I know, God, that the results that you want to see happen will take place. And God, I give you praise for that in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Itziana. I appreciate that. Here we are this morning on this last Sunday of October 2021. Tomorrow, it's already going to be November. Hard to believe. I feel this champion series, I believe this, it has been directly from the heart of God. I pray that you not only feel the same way, but as I say so often, that Should Jesus tarry long after this series has come and gone, that we would still by living, we would still be living by the principles that have been taught from this pulpit in this series. I want you to listen to the journey that we have been on over these last eight and now nine weeks. Is there not a cause? All about family, a life of serving. And I will say here, we could use help in the area of serving, Paul. Pearl got a hold of me today and said, we need about two to four people that could help in the videography part. So he's the gentleman back there in the back who has done a tremendous job every Sunday. He could use your help. Yes, let's give it up for Paul. Appreciate you, Paul. We could use two to four people. If you'll see him today, many hands make make light work. A life of serving. Week four, when Jesus is in your boat. Week five, champions are not easily offended. Week six, champions are givers. Week seven, champions redeem the time. And then last Sunday was week eight, champions pray in the dark. All of those messages, if you're new, are on our social media platforms. 
But I believe if we don't get today's message right, we won't get the other ones right. I truly not only believe this, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that champions for God are those who love and seek unity and diversity. Christians, I believe more than any other entity in our world today, Christians need to be at the forefront of seeking to get along with every nationality, every tribe, every race, every kindred, every tongue, every culture that is out there today, Christians need to lead the way in those areas. Amen? Amen. I did a Hope College project um, over these last few weeks, and I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Cole. I know his family is here, but I love Dr. Cole. He is my brother in Christ, and he and I have been doing a Hope College project entitled The Sacredness of Human Life, The Church at the Intersections of Faith and Race in Ottawa County. My part in the project was to get 10 Christian leaders in the area of ministry to sit down with me, and I would give them around 10 questions as it relates to faith and race, and then the church's involvement with such issues. It was truly a very informational type of project. It was inspirational. It was an enlightening experience. And it is our goal, Dr. Cole, and my goal to be able to do two more projects with this, three phases total. It would seem, I think you would agree with this, and it's not like I set out to do this on purpose. I believe the Holy Spirit directed it. But it would seem that over these last two years, My preaching and my speaking has been more on what the Bible has to say with some of the current issues and events that are taking place in our world and in our nation. I think a pastor who doesn't look at the pulse of what's going on in our world and in our nation is missing out. I believe that what we are seeing being played out today in our world is very prophetic in nature. I look at this, I I use the calendar to my advantage as a pastor. Today is Halloween. We do not celebrate Halloween. Halloween used to be all all called All Saints Day, and I'm not gonna give you the history of that, but it's become very pagan. But we take a day on the calendar where there's a lot of things that happen that are not godly. And we know that God has said that not one day is more special than another. He is Lord of the Sabbath. So we take a day that, you know, represents the kingdom of darkness, and we overwhelm it with the kingdom of light. And so this past Wednesday, when we had that Harvest Fest, we were giving people and young children more about Jesus Christ. So we take what the calendar gives us because we know that Jesus is in control of everything. Well, I'm here today not to address COVID. In fact, I probably, unless God would have me share it again, I probably will not do it again because we have been inundated over the last two years. We have seen the fallout. We have even seen the epic fallout on the impact it has had on churches and upon believers as well. But I want to talk about something today that has been around for generations, It's very key that you hear me today and let the movement be as as minimal as possible, if that is possible. But I want to talk about something that has been around for generations. And while you are here today and you cannot help what previous generations did when it came to unity, race, and diversity, and that is a statement to all ethnic groups, we cannot change the past. But we can take the past, we can learn from it to build for a better future. At least as it pertains to the church of Jesus Christ, seeing life saved, delivered, and healed by the power of God and brought into the kingdom before the Lord returns for his church. Isn't that the goal? To take as many people to heaven as we can. I want to make something very clear today, and I don't want anyone to misunderstand me, to take me out of context, or simply put, to not hear or see my heart. My heart is for all nations, all people groups, all cultures, all races, 
all tribes, that we all strive for unity in our diversity. I do not, and please hear me today and hear my heart, I do not apologize for being white because that's how God created me. Someone who is Hispanic, you should never apologize because that's how God created you. He created you Hispanic. And I believe that Spanish will be the language of heaven someday. I believe that. A black person should never apologize for being black because that's how God created them. A Chinese person should not apologize for being Chinese because that's the way God created them. Are you getting the picture? I could keep going. But this morning, what's at the heart of this message, and I know that over the last, you know, 20 months or so, especially about 10 months ago, we were inundated with this, but God gave me this message to end out the series because he's calling us to be champions. And what is in my heart today was what was brought to the forefront. Now, again, some of you might have a different perspective, and that's okay. But I'm going to share what I believe God gave me. But what has been in my heart was what came to the forefront on May 25th of 2020. Hear me first before I say it. Racism has existed for years and is still very much alive even yet today. I wasn't there that day in Minneapolis, Minnesota when George Floyd came out of a convenience store and the cops thought he was trying to use a $20 counterfeit bill. I don't know what was going through George Floyd's mind. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know what was going through Police officer Derek Chauvin's mind, only God knows both of their minds and the intentions of their heart that day. We can only go by what we saw. What I saw was a man who, yes, he had a checkered past, a man that had quite a few run-ins with the law. He had a criminal record for sure. But on this day, May 25th, 2020, what I saw Despite what may have led to the arrest, I believe it went too far by one Derek Chauvin. And in the midst of the breakout of COVID across this nation, a time when most people were supposed to be kind of locked down, and again, I know you already have your views about that, but we had riots begin to take place and COVID concerns kind of went out the window on our, you know, our streets of America, cities began to burn, restaurants and shopping centers were burning to the ground, and chaos ensued for months. And then I believe that on top of those things, hear this today, on top of what happened, the media then began to fan the flame of it even greater. It began to flame it. Racism is wrong. What Derek Chauvin did was wrong. But I believe the media took this, and I believe they thought they had what was known as the perfect storm. They already had COVID, the political things and the tension that was happening, and they began to push something to see America collapse from the inside out. I believe most media, you might not agree with me, but I believe that most media actually want to see America collapse. And I don't understand that. I don't get that. Why would you not want to see America succeed? But they began to push things. and They wanted to see America collapse. And the sad part is, in large part, They succeeded. But to say racism, not just against blacks, started with this in May of 2020. If you believe that, you would have your head in the sand. Racism has been around for thousands of years. You heard me right, thousands of years. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see people hating one another based on where they were from, what race or what tribe they came from, what part of the then known world that they came from. 
There was not just, there's, today there's not just racism against blacks, even though that has been brought to the forefront. But I believe there is racism today in many different ethnicities that are around the globe today. Even if you feel personally you don't have a racist bone in your body, it's in our world nonetheless, even if you're tired of hearing it. Because why? I've seen it. And I know you have to. I've experienced it with my own eyes. And I am sure that throughout my 52 years on this earth, I've allowed my sinful nature to make me guilty of it as well. I'm not going to spend a long time with what I'm about to say, but i got to bring some context. Honing in for just a few moments this morning on what has been done to blacks over the centuries. Before I move on, let me say this. Some might be concerned today, you're saying, you know, Pastor Mike, you're using the name black and maybe you should be using the term African American. Well, I did some research and I want to learn. We all need to learn, church. Every day we should be learning something. But black refers to dark-skinned people of African descent, no matter their nationality. African American refers to people who were born in the United States and have African, African ancestry. And many people use the term, these terms interchangeably. Hear me, I would never say black in a derogatory way because God has made all people on this earth. But here it is. 400 years after enslaved Africans were first brought to Virginia, most Americans still do not know the full history or the full story. Excuse me. Get there. I'm sorry. Sometime in 1619, a Portuguese slave ship, the Seo Heo Batista, traveled across the Atlantic Ocean with a hull filled with human cargo. Captive Africans from Angola in southwestern Africa. The men and women and children, most likely from the kingdoms of Nadango and Congo, endured the horrific bound for a life of enslavement in Mexico. Almost half the captives had died by the time the ship was seized by two English pirate ships. The remaining Africans were taken to Point Comfort, a port near Jamestown, the capital of the English colony of Virginia, which the Virginia Company of London had established 12 years earlier. The colonist John Rolfe wrote, and this is his words here, to Sir Edwin Sandys of the Virginia Company that in August 1619, a Dutch man of war arrived in the colony and brought not anything but 20 and odd Negroes. This is his word. Which the governor and Cape Merchant bought for vic victuals. The Africans were most likely put to work in the tobacco fields that had been recently established in the area. But here's what many do not know. I'm not saying it was right, but it happened. Forced labor was not uncommon. Africans and Europeans had been trading goods and people across the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean for centuries. But enslavement had not been based on race. The transatlantic slave trade, which began as early as the 15th century, introduced a system. It was racialized. Inherited. Enslaved people were not seen as people at all, but as commodities to be bought and sold and exploited. And though people of African descent, free and enslaved, were present in North America as early as the 1500s, the sale of, quote, the 20 and odd African people set the course of what would become slavery in the United States. These first enslaved Africans in the British colonies that would become the United States of America, and they would, of course, be followed in bondage by hundreds of thousands more. So that tells me that even Africans had slaves, and so did the Europeans. And now hear me. I could go further here, but instead of trying to make this a history lesson, I want to create a sermon today, even though... I'm here to tell you we should learn from our history so that we do not repeat the areas where we failed or past generations failed. I want to take what I have spoken thus far, and though what I have said is just the tip of the iceberg, because again, let's just take what black people have years. 
As far back as December the 18th, 1865, they declared that day was slavery was abolished and done with, 1865. But it did not mean at all that freed black people's status in the post-war South was fine that laws. We know about them taking water guns and, and nailing, a, a, you know, nailing them with water currents and so forth. It still goes on even yet today in the hearts of people, and hear me, not just against blacks, but against even whites, against Chinese, against Japanese, against Vietnamese, against Laotians, against Hispanic. I could go on because at the present time there are 223 nationalities in, in, our, in our world, and some of those countries have ethnic variants of nationalities. And aren't you tired of hearing the word variant? Hmm. And once again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know why I'm spitting so much. In the front row, I hope you, hope you guys are okay because you might have to move back just a little bit. This is just the tip of the iceberg on the many things that could be said to help us learn from the past and how we, can, how we got to the present and how we need to learn from the past and even the present to hopefully create a better future until the Lord returns in the area of race relations, if not in our world, hopefully within the church of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that today? God wants that. Here is what I know God has for me this morning with the time that I have left. He wants champions for him to come out of Holland first. He wants champions for him that will lead the way in love with unity and diversity. And here is where I want to spend the rest of my short time that I have left. Number one, champions should love unity and diversity because in the beginning we were created Imago Dei. In the very beginning we were created Imago Dei. That means in his image. Listen to it. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 makes it clear. Then God said... Let us make man, mankind, in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is 100% truth, and you're hearing it from this pulpit this morning, Man in the beginning was created in God's image. This was something I heard almost everyone that I interviewed, they would lead with that when I, when I gave them the first question. The first question in my project was this. As a Christian leader, you are guided by the teachings of Christ found in the Gospels and by the Word of God. In your own words, what does the Bible have to say about race? Probably half or more than half, slightly more than half that I interviewed, they led with this answer that we all were created in a mago day. We were created in the image of God. That is 100% true. But I just need to say if we stop there, we're missing something. If we stop there, we're missing something. Look at Genesis 1. Once again, and I want to start, in fact, I believe, maybe I have the wrong chapter, but uh, it says, I think it's Genesis 3. Maybe I'm wrong. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And in fact, yes, this keep, go ahead and keep that up. I think I gave you the wrong scripture. Somebody find me the scripture. I believe it's mankind fell in Genesis 3. If you have it, tell me because I want to make sure everybody gets this right. Now the serpent was more cunning. Pastor Pete, just look it up and let me know. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Is it Genesis 3? It's Genesis what? 3. Okay, Genesis 3, because my notes are wrong and I made my first mistake ever. No, I'm kidding. I've made many. Genesis 3, and I apologize, guys. I got you the wrong scripture there, but it's Genesis 3 starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, for shall, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. He's basically, no he is, he's calling God a liar. 
For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was ple- pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of she also gave to their husband, and he ate as well. Seven. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me, notice the blame shifting. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, she gave me the tree and I ate. She gave me of the tree. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Here it is. This is the part you got to catch. Mankind was given a choice, a free will. And through what is known as voluntary transgression, and through what is known as voluntary transgression, the Imago Dei was marred. It was marred. The first Adam failed and sinned and damaged the oneness, the Imago Dei he had with God. The second Adam, Christ Jesus, he came to get it back. And when we accept Christ, we still will have now a sinful nature. According to Genesis 3 and Psalms 51 verse 5. But we now get to stand in Christ's righteousness And when we truly begin to stand in his righteousness, a thinking pattern through the power of the Holy Spirit begins to change. And now not only do we ask, what what did Jesus do? But now we do what Jesus did. And I know this, Jesus loves all and we should. He loves all. First, one of the main reasons that I love this church is because of its diversity every time we assemble. And I can't wait to when we're back 100% not there yet. I have had missionaries come and ask me, seriously, Pastor Mike, how in a Dutch city like Holland did you get so diverse? Well, Holland over the years has become a melting pot of different nationalities. Migrant workers from Mexico, and Latin America came here to work and ended up wanting to stay here and raising their families here. We've had Laotians come over to Holland and they now have also made it home and they're now raising their families here. But one morning, I was trying to express how much I love diversity. And I said something that even though my heart was pure, the words didn't come out right. I said, and I quote, when I look around Holland first, I don't see color. And what I meant by that was, when I look around Holland first, all I see is God's people. That's all I see. But I had a brother in Christ come to me, and I'm very glad he did. But he came up to me and he said, I know exactly what you meant, but I believe you meant to say or should have said, you do see color and you love it. And I said, well, that's what I meant. I was saying that I love people. But he said, you should see the diversity and it should be something that blesses you. And I'm like, that's what I meant from the start. The very next week, I corrected my statement. But it was what I was trying to say all along. I see color and I love it. It's what heaven's going to look like. I mean, come on, church. It's what heaven's going to look like. And the reason why I say it is because in the beginning, that was God's desire. We were created in his image. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. No wonder they tried to get that in our minds as little children because it's the truth. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Yes, the Imago Day was marred. But when you give your life to Jesus, and and I've given my life to Jesus, there's a spiritual metamorphosis that takes place 
from the inside out, and your sin, even though you have a sinful nature, you've also be given, you've been given a new nature, a new nature that says the past has gone, the new has come. And one of those attitudes in the new has to be a love for unity and diversity, knowing that that was God's intentions and plans from the very foundations of the earth. Let me take you to a story real quick that exemplifies Imago Dei, how it was marred when there was a fall. Genesis 4 now, starting at verse 1. I do have this scripture correct. Now Adam knew knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. She bore again, this time a brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel, he came and brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat, the best. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain became angry and his countenance began to change. It fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do now, if you do not, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive, a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on this earth. And Cain said, surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden now. God from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond upon the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me, they're going to try to kill me. The Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Seven's the number of completion. The Lord literally set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Let me give you what I believe is the proper hermeneutics here. There's something here in this narrative that sometimes gets overlooked, and it's this. Not only what Cain did was wrong to his brother, we know that he did it out of jealousy, but the point that many miss is God's love for humanity. So much so that he marked Cain and said if anyone would try to kill him for what he had done, it would come back on that person sevenfold. Seven equals completion. Why did he do that? God wanted Cain to know the full weight of what he had done. He wanted him to know the full weight of what he had done. Here's the question posed to us today that was spoken by Cain in haste. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is a resounding yes. Yes, you are. Why? Because we're image bearers of God when we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, racism, hatred, discord, you name it, has no place for an image bearer that belongs to the king. Number one, in the beginning, we were created Imago Dei. Number two, we must see everyone as Christ sees them of immense value. Go with me quickly, if you would, to John 4, starting at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by a well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water in the heat of the day, mind you. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, who was the gift of God? It was him right there. And who it is who says to you, Give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and we drank from it himself, he drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But that water that I will give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to her, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Ouch. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Yeah. Our fathers worship on the mountain. You Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said this, I know that the Messiah who is coming, who is the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Did you notice the title of this? Scholars have given the title of this passage, A Samaritan Woman Meets Her Messiah. Hear these words today. Jesus came for all. Jesus died for all. Now, I'm going to throw something here. Don't miss it because you might brand me a heretic and you wouldn't be hearing all of it. Jesus is inclusive. Some of you are like, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh. The last time I checked, inclusive means all. All means all. That means Jesus excludes no one. But sometimes people stop there. It's where they get off the rails and they're sidetracked. God, through his son Jesus, he loves them in their sin, but he calls them out of their sin. There's the huge difference. There's the huge difference. Because if we say he's all-inclusive, that means he doesn't have to be a change. If we didn't have to change, there'd be no need of a Savior. We would be perfect. But because all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, we need Jesus. And there needs to be a change. How do I know this to be true? Look now real quickly. And boy, this is better than going to a buffet. I really believe it is. I believe that. My my wife has got a crock pot going today, so we're going to be good. But look at John 8, starting at verse 1. Now, this is how I know that he accepts them as they are, but then he wants to see a change. Now, early in the morning, he came into the temple. Down and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had said in their, him, uh, her in the midst, you know the story, but just listen to it now through the lens of this. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. She was caught in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, sh- the, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this to test him that they might have something which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he was without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And I have a feeling he was writing people's names that were there ready to cast stones. I just have a feeling. And one by one, those who heard it were convicted in their conscience. They went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was alone and the woman standing in her midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He looks at her and says, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has anyone condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And he said to her, neither do I condemn you. Here it is. Go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in, walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I want to tell you, I don't have time to share this, but the Samaritans, they were considered, and this is what they were considered in Bible times, they would literally call them half-breeds. 
because of interracial relationships and so forth. In fact, people literally on camel or on foot, they would bypass Samaria. Even if they had to go out of their way to get to where they're going, they would not come to Samaria. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Why would Jesus come right through Samaria? The bottom line is this. It's a question for us as well today. Jews had no, listen to this. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. With whom do you have no dealings? This lady was drawing water in the heat of the day. The Jewish women could draw the water in the cool of the night. This lady was considered a dog, a term that meant in that culture the lowest of the low. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. Why? Because he wanted to show very clearly he came to die for all. Everyone is of immense value to him. We read John 3, 16, and we stop short of it. We need to read verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That means the 7.9 billion people on this earth right now and all humanity ever born like the band to come. Here is a sound bite. <laughs> I know that's kind of an old-fashioned term, I've been told, but a sound bite I want you to jot down. I don't say that sarcastically, honey. I love you, and please feed me when I get home, okay? <laughs> we need to value what the Lord values. If you walk out here today, what your pastor preached on? Something about race and faith, I don't know. But if you walk out here today and say, I heard a lot of things, but I heard this, and it's going to stick. I need to value what God values. Then you've got the heart of the message. Number three, and I'm done. Worth dying for. Please stay with me. Worth dying for. Every person ever born, no matter what nationality, what culture, what language or dialect, the color of their skin, Jesus knew everyone was worth dying for, and if he is our example and the one we serve, racism, hatred, exclusion has no part in the child of God's lifestyle, or we need to check our relationship with God. Because in Acts 17, which I began with today, he said in verse 26, and he has made from one, Blood, every one blood, excuse me, every nation of men, men to dwell on the face of the earth. To God, and the band can just begin to play if they would, to God, everyone was worth redeeming. Everyone was worth dying for. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. The Old Testament system could never do it. It could only do it in part. Enter Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21. If you could just feel the weight of this scripture and the freedom of this scripture. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Church, what a deal. What a deal. Everyone is worth dying for, and if we can just believe this, oh, the difference that it could make. They say that, listen to this, they say that for two hours each Sunday, the church is the most segregated entity in the world. The church. Now, I know there's other variables that factor in. Churches may be in a community where one race is the dominant race. People from different races have their heart language of worship and gatherings on Sunday, and they tend to assemble with people that are they're, they're like them in those preferences. I get that. But what I will never get is if someone of a different skin color 
walk through the doors of a church in America and they get shunned, looked down on, mocked or ridiculed or the fires of hatred begin to burn. That is not of God, that is of the devil and it needs to stop in Jesus name. In Jesus name, it needs to stop. If God thought everyone was worth dying for so much that he would give up his only begotten son to redeem humanity, who are we to think anything different than our father's mindset? People may worship differently than you. People might celebrate differently than you. People might even talk a little differently than you. People might even look a little different to you, but it's not about you. It's about others. And it's about everyone feeling freedom to worship their creator in the way that they desire. Believe it or not, there is unity in that because at the core of the gospel, it's about unity. It's about diversity. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house today. If you have a dollar bill, get it out real quick, and you're going to pass it up to me. No, I'm kidding. Um, there's a dollar bill, and on the back here, I had to look for it, is an eagle. And in the eagle's wings, it says a Latin phrase. You want a dollar? There you go. Come and get it. See, you helped your mom and dad today. Now you get a dollar. It says, e pluribus unum. And it means that out of many, we are one. Out of many, we are one. In fact, I had to find out exactly the context of why E Pluribus Unum was now put on our Federal Reserve notes. The original currency at the time, it was a determination to form a single nation from a collection of states. But I believe it could be used today then when we look at it, we say this, no matter where you come from, no matter what your nationality, no matter what your race, no matter what your ethnicity, out of many, we are one. That brings God greatest glory, and I know this, champions love unity and diversity. And here is the proof, and this is where I close, I promise you, Revelation 7, verses 9 to 12, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and they worship God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever amen and that's the amen that we put on this series today amen and amen hallelujah praise you Lord that is my story and I'm sticking to it. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, Rabasi, Tiara, Rabosoto, Rabasi. Thank you, oh God. Thank you, oh God. God, the prayer I want to pray today. These altars are open. If we need an invitation to come, we're missing it. These altars are open. So I'm going to pray that final prayer that prayer of blessing, but it cannot come visit us until we have what we talked about today. Oh God, if there is anything in our heart of racism, hatred, or bias, or whatever, oh God, get rid of that in Jesus' name. Do it in me, God, I pray. And Lord, I pray that if we just feel so led, if we come to an altar, we're not saying that we battle with racism, not at all, but it's saying we just want to love on our God so that when we get up, we can go into our mission field and make a difference because someday we're going to be gathered as far as the human eye can see and every race will be represented on that day. But God, until that day, we have a work to do in Jesus' name. May the Lord now bless you and keep you. 
may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his incredible peace. To the praise and to the glory of his name, in Jesus' name. And we all said this morning, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. He's all just